Okej, okay, är ni redo? Då hälsar vi Monty Dom och Gunnar Karlsson varmt välkomna. Hello. Wow. It's like a pop concert. <laughs> Så himla roligt och varmt välkomna alla ni som har kommit hit idag. Det här är helt fantastiskt. För att träffa Monty Dom. Englands stora trädgårdsprofil. Ge honom en applåd till. Kanske mest känd som programledare för eh, Gardeners World. Hur många har tittat på Gardeners World? <laughs> A few. Good. A few. Yeah. A few. Han leder också sändningar, BBC-sändningar från Chelsea Flower Show. Om ni har varit där någon gång så vet ni att det är han som står för programmen som sänds varje dag sänder BBC från Chelsea eh, fem, sex dagar under en vecka. Så so, BBC rules when it's about garden programs. I think they do. They yes. do. Yes. So welcome to Sweden. Thank you. It's Ossofiru. a huge pleasure. Yeah. Huge pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm slightly reeling at all these faces around. Mm -hmm. These happy faces. Did you know that you were so popular in Sweden? I hoped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Well known. Well, it's lovely. Well known. Yeah. It's lovely, yes. Uh, first time in Sweden, I understand. This is my very first day ever in Sweden. <laughs> And what a fantastic place to spend it. Yeah. It's great. First time in Sweden, and he started in Helsingborg. It's ganska okay, isn't it? How come you haven't been here before? No one has invited me. Uh, I'm also, I haven't been everywhere. You haven't? You know, no, no, it's I odd that. So. Okay. It's, it's, but that's one of the joys of life. There's still mm. places to explore. Oh yes, some more for you. Yes, well. You arrived yesterday or very late. I actually late. arrived today, late this today. morning. Yeah. Very early this morning, yeah. Was it hard to leave your garden in England? Well, I was, <laughs> I nearly missed the plane because I was clipping some new topiary. Uh, and I had this big debate, do I clear it up and miss the plane, or do I leave it for someone else to clear up and catch the plane? And? I left it for someone else to clear up. <laughs> We're so happy that you did. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the plane was then delayed. I could have cleared it up. <laughs> well, that's life. Yeah. But you travel a lot. Yeah. Do you miss your garden when you are yes, away from it? Yes, I do. It? I mean, that's obviously... People think it's very romantic and glamorous traveling the world, being paid, flying first class or club, eating glorious meals, seeing beautiful gardens, being wined and dined wherever you go, it's a hard life. Uh, no, the truth is, as you know, filming is busy, long days, often not very glamorous hotels or flights or whatever, and you're focused, you're working. Mm. And I miss my garden, yes. Uh, sometimes people say it must be wonderful to have been in wherever you were. And I think, well, it would have been more wonderful to be back at home. Yes, probably. Um, but so, I love the opportunities, I love the experiences, and it's a privilege. <laughs> but my favorite times are at home in my garden. With your dogs? With my dogs. Has anyone <laughs> seen my dogs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would, uh, if I had bought my dogs, they would be more famous. <laughs> That's the only thing you know. Uh, I have spent... 30 years building a career, and I've finally reached the summit of my ambition to be a dog handler. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine saw the press picture with Monty and Nigel. Yeah, Nigel, yes. Oh, and he said, oh, Nigel, is Monty coming too? <laughs> <laughs> I, often, I often get on a plane, and people will say, where's Nigel? <laughs> or in a train, or, or up a mountain, or, or the other side of the world. Where, haven't you got Nigel? <laughs> Well, no, his passport didn't come through. No, <laughs> he's back home. Yeah. So we know a lot about English garden in Sweden because we have looked at your programs yeah. and we, we're a bit of obsessed of, of your country and the garden. Um, you've learned a lot about garden. You learned us. So uh, what's gardening to you? I hope you want to say something about that now. So I do, yes. Please, Monty Don. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, as I say, it's, well, it's a wonderful thing to not only spend my first day in Sweden, and I hope it's not my last, but to spend it here at this fabulous place, this beautiful garden and this wonderful garden festival. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here.
It's marvelous. And what I wanted to talk to you about, really, was a question that doesn't very often get asked, at least not back at home, which is, why do we garden? Uh, we often, in, in Britain, we are obsessed with how you garden. And we often ask when, where, what, sometimes who, but very rarely do we ask why. And I have to say, the reason that I started to garden was down to my mother. Uh, because my mother was one of those British women that broke the mold. They, they went through the war. My mother, for example, she didn't like Mrs. Thatcher because she thought she was too weak. <laughs> she, um, so when my mother asked you to do something, you did it. You certainly never asked why. And she would, when I was a little boy, I'd be about seven, and she would say to me, what are you going to do this afternoon? And I would wait to be told what I was going to be doing this afternoon. And it was always a job in the garden. It was always weeding the strawberries, turning the compost, clipping the edges, mowing the lawn, whatever. And for 10 years, I worked in the garden two, three hours every day, which is a long time for a little boy, or it felt to me. And I have to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I hated it. <laughs> I hated gardening with all my soul. And the only reason I gardened was in order that I might stop gardening. It's like the man who banged his head against a wall in order that it would stop hurting when he stopped. So I did my gardening like a penance, like a duty, until I was about 17. And by 17, I knew how to garden because I had to, I'd learned. I didn't want to know. It was not knowledge I thought I ever needed, but I did know how to do it. And I was at school, and this was about my fourth school. I'd been expelled from three schools. <laughs> you don't want to know why. <laughs> and I, I had hair down to there. And I remember coming home from school, and I made a cup of tea, and it was a spring morning in Hampshire. I don't know if any of you have been to Hampshire. It's the middle of England in the south. And where I was brought up on chalk, chalk soil. And it was spring, and the chalk was warming up. And there's a kind of smell you get with chalk as it warms. And I was outside, and I had prepared the ground, and I was sowing carrots. And at 17, I knew how to run a vegetable garden. I could do it. And I was preparing the ground, and it was part of the rotation. It came after brassica, which came after legumes. And I didn't add any compost, because that would make them fork and split. I knew all those things. And I prepared the ground, and I ran a drill with the side of my hand. And I poured carrot seed into the palm of my hand. And suddenly, I was filled with a feeling of ecstasy, of bliss a sense that I needed and wanted nothing else in the world. And I have to say that was a very strange feeling because up until that moment, the three things I thought I really needed badly were sex and drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> and I wasn't getting any sex or drugs or rock and roll at 17 in provincial England. And I certainly didn't think I needed seed in my hand and the soil. So it was strange. And that night I had a dream. I dreamt I put my hands in the ground and my fingers grew like roots deep, deep into the ground, 20, 30 feet. And I woke and I felt calm and rested. And ever since that day, I know I need the soil. I need to get my hands in the ground. When I am tired, it refreshes me. When I am upset or sad, it encourages me. When I am depressed, it gives me hope. When I'm angry, it calms me down. And when I'm happy, it makes me share that happiness with the earth and the soil. 
And to this day, the one thing I love more than anything else is just growing things, tending the soil. It doesn't matter what. I'm just as happy growing cabbages as I am the rarest plant in the world. It's what really gives me pleasure and fires me is just looking after plants and creating a beautiful garden. Well, that was fine. I was 17. I discovered this fact about myself, but I had nobody to share it with. Back then, in 1971, 72, I knew nobody that gardened. It was not cool at all. I wanted to not walk down the garden path, but to walk on the wild side. So I, had, I kept it to myself until I met my wife, Sarah. And she was interested in gardens, which was great. And I fell in love with her and I tried to woo her, which was difficult because she was married to somebody else. Um, but, you know, life is complicated. So in the end, my tactics for wooing Sarah were to cut her grass <laughs> with a pair of kitchen scissors. <laughs> she had a little house with some lawn. She didn't know what she wanted to cut. So I said, I'll do it. I can garden. I looked around for tools. There were none, but in her kitchen, she had a little pair of scissors that big. So I cut her lawn with it. And she came back and she gave me a look, which she gives me every single day for the last 35 years since, which is... You fool. <laughs> you are an idiot. <laughs> but we've been together ever since then. And I've had somebody to share my gardens with. And we made gardens together, and we used to go and visit gardens together. And I'd say to all of you, visit gardens. Wherever you go, find gardens, look at them. If you don't like them, work out why you don't like them. If you do, what is it? that really draws you to it? What's the name of that plant that looks so good? Why does that one plant stand out and the others don't? Or why do those two plants together look great, but apart are a bit boring? And we endlessly visited gardens. And slowly we began to learn about them together and we made a garden in London. Now back in those days, this is 35 years ago, more, um, we had a jewelry business in London, and we were very f part of fashion. And a magazine came to do an interview with us about our home, our house. And we were young, we were 27, 28, we had this house, we were opportunity, and they looked out the window and said, hey, that's a great garden. Who did you pay to do your garden? <laughs> that's fighting talk, where I come from. I said, nobody, I did my garden. So they took a picture in my garden. And a newspaper picked that up and they came and did another picture and we were odd because no one was young. And then a television company was looking for researchers, uh, for, for presenters, and I got a phone call saying, would I do a screen test? And I said, no, I don't really want to be on television. Why? And they said, oh, well, we pay you a hundred pounds. I said, I might want to be on television. <laughs> Just maybe. So. I went and did a screen test which involved reading the news for a gardening program. I read the news and they said, fine, you can do gardening. <laughs> so I did these gardening things live on television. I'd never done television before and it was okay and it seemed to go fine and they gave me a hundred pounds and they gave me another hundred pounds, another hundred pounds. This went on for about two months. And then they called me to the head office and this is back in 1988, 89. Now, in my life up till then, the head office meant the headmaster said it meant trouble. <laughs> it meant I, I'd done something wrong and I was going to get into trouble. So I thought, okay, fine. They've rumbled me. They realize I can't do it. So I went along and they said, how would you like to make 40 films on any subject you like as long as it's on gardening? And I have a, a policy in life which is when you come to a, a fork in the road and it's a yes, no answer, always say yes. And you might find out why you should have said no. <laughs> but if you say no, you'll never know what it would have been like if you had said yes. So I said yes. They said, fine, 
one little thing, as I was leaving, so one little thing. Could you by tomorrow morning have a synopsis of all 40 programs printed out in Centrus? <laughs> so on the train home, I wrote down all the jobs my mother used to give me. And to address them up, I went home, I typed them up till two in the morning, I faxed them through, there was no email in those days. Half past nine the next morning, I got a phone call saying, yeah, fine, we begin next week. <laughs> okay, so I then spent the next year doing this. It was fantastic education. We went all over Europe, we went to places, I could do whatever I liked as long as it was on gardening. Now that's impossible. We were talking at lunch about getting things commissioned. I've been doing it a long time. I sort of can do anything I want. It takes me a year to get a couple of programs commissioned. So to have 40 commissioned overnight, unheard of. Uh, so I didn't realize what a big break it was. And I met the producer years later. And by then I'd been on national television for years. I'd done a lot. And I said to him, what did you see in me back then? And to be honest, I was fishing for compliments. He said, oh, that's easy. He said, that week we've been told that our budget for those programs would be withdrawn unless we handed in a synopsis on the Friday. And the only two people who looked as though they could do it was you and there was another guy who was working as a cleaner. And he had taken the day off, so we chose you. <laughs> so my big break in television was pure accident, nothing to do with talent, and that's the way it goes. That's life. And now, and now after all these years, I have traveled the world, I've made thousands of hours of television, I've done it. Now, I am ruled by a bloody dog. <laughs> I have this dog called Nigel. And how many people here have heard of Nigel? Yeah, well, forget it. Nigel has become insanely grand and arrogant, impossible. And just this week, I was filming this week, and when we do Gardener's World, we have a big team. We have nine people. We have three cameras, sound recorders, director, producer, runners, we have lighting. And so we've got a set up and I had to bring the wheelbarrow around. And the director said, right, come along here, bring your wheelbarrow, put it down there, pick up a plant. You just talk to that camera, talk, turn around, talk to that camera, and then throw to Carol Klein, who is going to do a tape over there. Got it? Yeah, fine. Okay. Camera's ready, yeah, camera one, camera two, camera three, you're over there, sound good, fine, action. I come around the corner, as I'm coming around the corner, I hear one of the cameras go, oh, hang on a minute, I've just got to, oh, look at that, look at him. And there is Nigel, like this. His tail waving in the sunlight. And he turns and looks at me. He knows. He knows he has ruined my life. And I am so glad he's not here today because none of you will be listening. So over the years, since I was 17 and I had that moment, that sort of Damascene moment, there are certain things I have learned about gardening that I want to share with you about why we garden. Because the more I garden, the less I know, but the more pleasure I get from it. So I try and work out why that pleasure is. And the first thing to realize is gardening is about making something useful and or beautiful with nature. How you do that does not matter. It doesn't matter when you prune, what you prune with, when you plant, when you move plants. If it works, it's the right thing to do. Forget all the rules. Try things. If it works for you and your next door neighbor says, no, you shouldn't do it like that. He's wrong, you're right. That's number one. There are no rules except the ones that work for you. And the procedure of doing things correctly tends to be 
all about you and not about gardening. I made a series about gardening in France. And it was fascinating watching the difference between English and French gardeners. Because, for example, if English people got together to plant a hedge in a village, a communal hedge, there would be a meeting, there would be a committee, they would <laughs> all get together, they'd drink a lot of tea, and then they would ask practical questions. Should it be an evergreen hedge or a deciduous hedge? And what should the spacing be between plants? How deep should the trench be? Should we put compost under it or over it? How thickly should we mulch? Should we plant young plants that will grow quickly or bigger plants that would look good? And they would discuss all this and someone else would say, oh, we should plant in September. And someone else would say, oh, no, 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 October. And another person would say, well, I think we should do it in the morning. And someone else says, oh, it's always better to plant in the afternoon. And so it would go. And finally, they would agree They'd roll up their sleeves and they'd all get stuck in and they'd dig and they'd do it and they'd plant it and they'd water it and then they'd go and have a nice cup of tea. <laughs> the French would look at a hedge and discuss the philosophy of hedges. <laughs> hedges in art, hedges in history, the military implications of hedges. They would row furiously, never speak to each other again. Families would be split asunder and then they'd come back and they'd have glorious food and talk about it and agree not to talk about the hedge and then they would talk about the hedge and then finally they'd pay someone else to plant the hedge. <laughs> But the hedges would both be the same. They would both look as good. There are always different ways of doing the same thing. Now when it comes to design, The first rule I would say is you can never have too much green. We all want color, but look around you. It's a green world. Make green gardens. A white garden is a green garden with a little bit of white. Too much white kills it. I went to Istanbul the other day to film uh, tulips. Seven million tulips in the park in Istanbul of which about a million were white. And it was appalling. A sea of white tulips is like bad snow. <laughs> It's not good. A little bit of white, a lot of green. Green levers, leavens everything. Green gives structure and shape. Green gardens always work. You must make somewhere in your garden where you can be private and relaxed. I always used to say in my more irresponsible youth is you should be able to make love in your garden without offending your neighbors. <laughs> well, whatever, whatever you want to do. But you must have somewhere where you can sit and not feel overlooked, not feel that you are, can be anything other than in your own world. Make somewhere private, however small your garden is. Because what really matters is that you feel you possess this space. You don't have to have the piece of paper which says you own it. But you do have to feel that you at this moment are the sole possessor of this earth. And that comes from how you create the space. And without that, everything else is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what plants you use. What does matter is you create a sense of ownership and occupation. When it comes to making paths and borders, make your borders bigger. However big your borders are, make them bigger and make your paths smaller. The great mistake certainly in Britain is you have narrow little borders and lots of grass. Get rid of grass. Grass is boring. Here, look, come here if you want grass. Come and come to a park. In your garden, dig them up. Grow plants, have narrow paths and big borders. And that actually makes a garden seem bigger and gives it space and luxuriance. So always, always go for maximum size on your borders. Make your garden personal. Forget what anyone else might do. Don't try and copy other gardens. It must be about you. Find out what you love and do that in the garden. And if other people think it's odd, fine. 
doesn't matter. Guns are personal. Guns are private. Guns are about gardeners and humanity much more than they are about plants. Because without a gardener, there can be no garden. Nature does plants really well. It doesn't need you. Nature doesn't want you. Your garden does. So make it about you, and then it would work. Because modern life, one of the features in my life that I've seen, and having traveled so much, is that the proliferation of nowhere, of spaces that could be anywhere. You get into a plane that is like every other plane, you get out into an airport that's like every other airport, you drive through the outskirts of a city that is like every other city, with the same shops, the same things. That is death for the soul. Whereas a garden can be personal and have life, even if the house in front of it is exactly the same as the other houses. So make it personal and focus on creating a place that is like nowhere else. You do not want your garden to be a perfect mini copy of somewhere else that is beautiful. You want your garden to be beautiful because it is not like anywhere else. So give it identity. And this doesn't mean closing in. It doesn't mean not sharing. Because when something has identity, it's strong. It can share. You can take ideas from other people. You can give ideas. You can give away plants. You can borrow. You can copy. And if you have a real sense of identity, nothing is lost and everything is gained. Whereas if you, if you want to be like somewhere else, then it starts to close in. So open out, but be private and personal. Most people never really look at either their own gardens or anyone else's. Every morning I get up and I kick Nigel out of bed. <laughs> and I kick my, no, I don't kick my wife out of bed. <laughs> My wife kicked me out of it. I get up and I go outside and I look at it. Now we've been in my garden, our garden for 26 years. And I try every morning to look at it for the first time. Because every day is different. Look at it. Look at it with fresh eyes. Apart from anything else, notice where the sun rises. Make sure that you get up at dawn every day of the year, over a period of years if you like, see where the sun rises. You should know where the sun rises on April the 23rd and June the 15th and September the 4th and November the 16th. And if it's anything like my garden in this part of the world, it hardly rises at all. It just skims the surface. The like notice it. Notice where it sets. Notice where the shade is. Notice where suddenly it's a little bit colder than anywhere else. Why? I don't know. It just is. Because those are going to be the things that define your garden just as much as the choice of plants. Just as much as your skill. And if you know those things, you work with them. You don't fight against it at all. And then start looking at the plants they are. Every leaf. One of the most interesting aspects of any garden are the spaces between things. The spaces between leaves, the gaps, the entrances, the exits, the thin air. Air is really beautiful because it is shaped by everything around it. Look at them. We're so busy as gardeners, we just take it for granted. Try and look at it with fresh eyes all the time. And then you will start to make changes constantly. The changes keep coming and changing, making changes is part of good gardening. Trying to arrive at a finite end always fails. You're not trying to achieve anything, you're trying to be it. Gardening is like a river, it flows. And it's always moving, it's never the same. It never reaches anywhere other than now, at this moment. And so you need to be aware of it. You need to really be honed and sharpened and sensitive to that moment. Obviously, you need to know the seasons. You need to know how they creep in. Our seasons are changing. The climate is changing. 
You cannot fight that. You have to go with it. You have to work with nature, not against it. As when I was a young man, I worked on a farm. And an old farm laborer said, well, there's one thing you need to know, boy. Don't piss into the wind. <laughs> it's a crude way of putting it, but he was right. You'll never win. Nature will always win. So don't fight it. And yet, a lot of gardening is seen as conquering nature. If you look at the 17th century gardens where you have straight lines, you have control, you have order, but it was always doomed to failure. It's that balance between man and nature and combining the two and the sense of harmony and partnership that makes a successful garden. And it will be different. It will be different wherever you go. And to a certain extent, be untidy. Let long grass grow. Have water. Have some weeds because that will encourage insects, it will encourage wildlife. And without wildlife, you will not have a healthy garden. I'm an organic gardener, and I have been for the last 30 years. I'm a head of the organic movement in Britain. And slowly, people, it was very significant that last week, the Royal Horticultural Society made the earth-shattering announcement that you shouldn't use pesticides to kill things, <laughs> because it might kill bugs that are eating other bugs that are doing harm. Well, who would have thought it? <laughs> who would have guessed? You need to encourage diversity. And for that, you need to allow some disorder. Don't tidy everything away. Leave cover. As I was saying, long grass and water are the two things that will uncover nature in. And that balance Lots of birds. If you listen to Gardener's World, you will hear incredible bird song. I often get letters saying, we love Gardener's World, but why do you put on that phony bird song? <laughs> I have news for you, it's not, it's real. Because we have lots of birds. And we have lots of birds because we have lots of insects. And we have lots of insects because we have lots of cover. It works. And it's a very, very healthy garden. And if in doubt, do nothing. Doing nothing is really effective. By and large, problems resolve themselves. I get lots of letters and emails saying, I've got holes in my hostas, should I dig them up? <laughs> my apple tree has got brown blodges on the leaves. And you say, how do the apples taste? Oh, the apples are fine. What's the blossom like in spring? Oh, the blossom's great. Is the apple growing? Yeah, yeah, it's growing, but these blodges on the leaf, just ignore them. <laughs> They'll go away. And it's true. So most problems sort themselves out. And it's really like human health. If you are healthy, if you are eating good food, if you are taking exercise, it doesn't mean to say you won't fall over and cut yourself. It doesn't mean to say that you may not get a cold, but you will heal. If you are fundamentally unhealthy, you will always have low-level illness growing away because you will not heal yourself. So go for the general health of the garden and don't focus on specifics. By and large, they are a distraction. And above all, look after your soil. Your soil is the most important thing in your garden. The statistics about soil are mind-boggling. We know far more about the deepest part of the ocean than we do one foot, half a meter down below the soil surface. We know next to nothing about it. All that we know is that we don't know a lot. There is a huge amount of life in the soil. Most of it bacterial, a lot of it fungal and we know practically nothing about it. So the best thing you can do is feed it. And the best way to feed it is by composting. Compost everything, everything that has lived. I could give you a master class on composting now, but I won't bother. But if you watch Garden as World, I did one the other day. Um, but all your kitchen waste, all your garden waste, compost it. 
And what compost does is it puts bacteria and fungi back into the soil. It is not a feed. It adds life. It's like a starter dough for sourdough bread. So you only need an inch on the surface of the soil and that feeds the soil and then you get the relationship between this life in the soil and plants. And what we are learning more and more, that healthy plants are the ones that have the best relationship with the life in the soil. Whatever that is, wherever it is, it's the nature of that relationship, not the amount of goodness. So the best thing you can do is cultivate your soil, not by digging necessarily, but by nurturing it. Feed it, give it compost, respect it, look after it. It is what your garden is growing from, after all. And you can find out if you have good soil by feeling it. I told you I put my hands, I had this dream, I put my hands going. But feel your soil. Is it warm? Is it cold? Does it smell good? And if it doesn't, what does it smell of? Is it a bit acrid? Is it a bit sweet? Does it feel dirty? Does it feel pleasurable? Does holding it feel a sensuous thing? These things will tell you about your soul. It should feel good. Work at it. Make your soul an important part of your garden. And what you will find is if you have a healthy soil, the plants will be healthy, and therefore the whole ecosystem will work. And prevention is always better than cure. If you stop problems coming by having healthy plants that have adapted and done, you won't have to worry about buying sprays and pesticides and fungicides and herbicides and brown blodges on your leaves and all that sort of thing. When it comes to plants, grow nothing that does not want to be there. I have a policy at my garden at Long Meadow is if a plant doesn't want to be with us, we don't want it to be there. So if it's not happy, fine, go. You cannot grow everything. Some gardens just are not suited to some plants. I went to school, I went to boarding school at seven. In fact, just down the road, from where the queen who planted this garden was brought up. And the soil there was sandy and acid and had lots and lots of pine trees and rhododendrons. That's why she brought rhododendrons to here. She loved it because it was where she grew up. I hated it because it was where I was sent away to school. Uh, for years, I couldn't look at a rhododendron without feeling ill and unhappy. That's, I've moved on. I've coped with that. But some soils are not suited for plants. Don't try and force it. Grow what wants to be there. Try not to interrupt the cycle of growth. Keep steady growth is the key. Better something grows slowly and steadily rather than a surge of growth. So don't overfeed if something is looking poorly. Just gently, gently bring things on. Steady growth is always healthier than spurts of growth. Because then you get soft tissue and that becomes attractive to aphids and fungi and pests and problems. Try and measure things along. And that's to do with timing. That's to do with knowing the weather. It's to do with knowing the seasons. It's to do with knowing your soil so you know when it warms up. All these things are connected. But I always feel that you should garden with your fingertips rather than with a clenched fist. It's delicate. It's balancing plates. You're like a conductor, just gently. You're like a conductor with brilliant musicians. They know what to do. Plants know how to grow. All you have to do is just gently coordinate and, and push them, your garden together. And always try and propagate. Collect seed, sow seed, take cuttings. You don't have to go and buy ready-made plants. Grow your own. It is so much more satisfying to raise plants yourself. And if you raise them from plants that have been healthy in your garden, it's a good start. You know that the result is likely to be healthy too. Don't be frightened. Give it a go. Go home 
this evening and take cuttings. <laughs> they may not work. Some will. Sooner or later they will. And then that is very satisfying and cheap too. Saves an awful lot of money. And just accept that failure is the most important lesson in a garden. If you don't have failure, you don't know why things are succeeding. Dare to fail. That is the way to make a good God. And accept that everything changes. Accept that it's not going to be the same. Accept that the good things will go as well as the bad things. And that's gardening. Gardening is a good metaphor for life. That in the end, the only thing that's real, the only thing that matters is here and now. And this is the garden. This is the moment. And if you can embrace that and relish it and enjoy it and not be too solemn, but be serious in so much you try with all your heart and all your soul to make it beautiful and celebratory, well, you'll have a good garden. And that's probably the most important lesson I can give to you. So thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. This was like a, a green love story, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm almost... Well, I'm... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, it's hard to find words after this, like a, like a love story for, to the garden. That's how I feel about it. Mm. I feel that it's richer than anything else. That it is... It's endlessly satisfying. I never... And if I'm bored with it, or if I think it's not going well, it's because I'm being boring. You know, that thing, you can say, somebody's being boring. I think it's me. <laughs> and that's sometimes, sometimes in the garden it's dull. But that's because I'm not trying hard enough. And then you can go back and make it work. One thing that is interesting with you, you live in the, the, the greatest green country in the world, England. And you are, you have... Sounding like a Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> no Brexit. No. Uh, and you have, you have no education in horticulture yourself. No, I... And that's interesting. Well, the reason I have... No, well, it's not a reason. As I said, as a child, I was brought up to garden. And, it, I mean, my two brothers are very good gardeners. So it wasn't just that I had a passion for gardening that was encouraged. We were actively taught how to garden at home. And but in a very, very uncreative way. Mm. You know, you do it like this and you do it now. And you can't stop doing it until I say. Uh, so, in a sense, that was an education. Yes. That was a, that was a good education in one sense. Um, but, as I in intimated earlier, I've always been a bit of a rebel. I never got on at school. I, I was kicked out of various schools. And we would like to hear that story. No, it was more than <laughs> one. Uh, anyway, and, but then I discovered when I was about 18, having done really badly in my exams, that I wanted to prove to myself I could do well because I thought I was clever. So I retook, when I was working on a farm in the evenings, I retook my exams and got into Cambridge. And at then, when I was at Cambridge, to finance myself, I used to work in gardens to earn money, and I could do that. And I discovered that I loved learning. I loved reading, and I loved going to libraries, and I would read voraciously about gardens and gardening. And I have done that ever since. Mm. I mean in a kind of obsessive way. I'd read everything and, and visit gardens endlessly. So it was like a, a course in autodidact self-learning that in many ways was much more thorough and much more extensive than any conventional course, not least because it's never stopped. <laughs> um, Worked out well. <laughs> so although I didn't have a conventional education in it, 
I actually had quite a thorough education. And also, because I have no formal training, I always feel I have to be better than those that do. <laughs> so you have to know more. And, and there is that kind of chip on the shoulder. You have you know that expression where you, you feel you have to prove yourself. Yes. So there's that too. So that's yeah. so what's your next project? What's happening um, in your life now? What's happening in my life? I am filming a series on Islamic gardens, uh, which we're halfway through. And I filmed in Spain, I've been in the Alhambra, I've been in uh, the Alcazar Real in Seville, I've been in Marrakesh, I've been in Istanbul. Um, I'm off to India in a few weeks' time, and we're trying to get into Iran. We're going to the Emirates. I've been filming in the UK, where there are various Islamic gods. So I'm doing that. I'm filming Gardener's World every week. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to Greece to see a garden that I've been working on. Uh, I have wrote a book earlier this year, which is coming out in three weeks' time, called Down to Earth. Uh, I've got to write another book this year about Islamic gardens, okay. uh, which has got to be delivered next spring. Um, I do four columns a week for newspapers. Okay. More? No, no, <laughs> enough, enough, enough. But when you come back to Long Meadow, yeah, to your own garden, yeah. Imagine you were there tomorrow. What was the first thing you would like to do in your garden tomorrow morning? Well, I'd like to finish what I was in the middle of, which is clipping, <laughs> clipping the, the is clipping the use. I made a film a few weeks ago about cloud pruning, Japanese cloud pruning, uh, with a man who had trained for seven years in Japan. And it was fascinating. And I've been to Kyoto, and I've seen the gardens there. And I had a very good day with him. And he persuaded me to give up all mechanical and electrical clippers and just used Japanese shears. Okay. Not least because he sold me a pair at the vast <laughs> expense. Uh, and so I'm be doing that. We're coming to that time of year when we're starting to sow plant bulbs. So um, I've got, I've just ordered um, three or 400 iris, iris reticulata and iris hystroides, which I will be planting in pots. Mm -hmm. And our bulb planting season begins really in a week or so. So daffodils, we don't plant tulips till November. Okay. Um, and at this time of year, it's very much a question of keeping the garden going for as long as possible, whatever that means. So um, a lot of staking, a lot of tying, a, a lot of cajoling goes on, you know, horse whispering, but to plants. <laughs> uh, uh, and the vegetable garden, of course, is a lot of harvesting. Mm. It's really reaching its peak about now. So gardening is a drug to you. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm addicted to gardening. Yes, you are. <laughs> and you are too, I suppose. Uh -huh. uh, we have time for some questions. Om ni vill ställa frågor till Monty så gör det nu. Vi har en mikrofon där och vill ni ställa på svenska så går det bra. Så det går jättebra. Får Då springer jag runt och får räcka upp handen lite grann. Det här är enda gången, enda chansen kanske. Faktiskt. Ja, titta, där är en fråga i brud på gräsmattan. Hello. Um, I was wondering the name Long Meadow, where does it come from? Is it was it already the name of the place before you moved? Well, I can tell you a secret. <laughs> um, Gardens World Gardens have always belonged to the main presenter. And they are always fictitious, made-up names. My garden is not called Long Meadow. <laughs> it has another name altogether. And what is that name? And <laughs> the reason why we don't give that name is because otherwise we'd have tens of thousands of people turning up. But I wrote a book called The Something Diaries, which will give you a clue, anyone who's ever read that book. Um, so, and also, in this days of Google Earth, you can find it. Um, it's in a village called Ivington, which is near Lempster in a county called Herefordshire in the west of England. So I called it Long Meadow because it's quite long and it was a meadow. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. That's an answer. Yeah. So you can't, we can't visit your garden. No, you never have an open garden. And there are two reasons why you can't visit my garden. 
the main and most important one is that there is no parking. The garden is down a little track, mm. just wide enough for a car. You can't get lorries down there. And there are six other houses down the track. So only w anybody going down, anybody coming up, one of them has to reverse the whole length of the track. When we film, we just managed to fit six cars in, and the crew <laughs> fit in the six cars. If I opened my garden to the public, in all modesty, there would be thousands of cars. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I said this to the police, and they said the police would probably ban it anyway because all the roads would be blocked. <laughs> we could buy the field next to us if they'd sell it and put in a road and car parking. But yeah. you know, come no. on. We look at the That's, television programs. Right. And the other thing is, my wife would divorce me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want that to happen. No. Next question, please. Uh, would you like to talk something more about the space in between? Well, it's, and the, uh, it's all about proportions. Yes, it's about proportions. I mean, there, there are two things going on there. One is my interest in sculpture. And it's with all sculpture, with all trees, with all plants, it's what happens in between things that defines the space. Space is defined by the absence. In terms of gardening, I mean, you can look at it with plants. Some flowers are very satisfying because the petals are spaced at good intervals. Other times, those intervals aren't so good. And you, it's really important when you're creating spaces in the garden that you get all the space right. So one of the things that people neglect in their garden is vertical space. We tend to think, oh, there's a the sky. The sky's up there. Well, your garden goes up there too. And um, there was a, a Mexican architect, uh, Louis Barragan. I don't know any of you know his work in the 40s and 50s. And he would make gardens and he always used to talk about compressing and releasing space. And the way he would do that would be by making enormously high walls. And the, the gap would look terribly narrow because the wall was high. When you got to it, it was about that wide. But when you looked at it from a distance, it looked like a slit. So as you approached it, it felt like you were going to have to go like this to get through. And then suddenly when you realized you could go through and you came out, you sort of went, oh. And so what he had done is take a space, crammed it together, and then released it. And you can do that with hedges. You can grow a hedge and have a gap. Instead of having the hedge that high, have it twice as high, three times as high. And that pulls the space in. And that's just one way of, of doing these things. And it's the same to do with when you have uh, width. If you have a space that says, why does this stage? The height either side of it will define the cubic area that matters. So you need to just pay attention to all those things. Is there a port mirror? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go home and try. Well, I mean, I, the one thing that I like, I like cubes. Um, and when you make a cube, it's surprisingly high. Uh, so we have two cubes in the garden. We've made one with lime trees. So we planted four limes. And then we pleached them, so they make a cube. And then I put another structure up, which is actually exactly the same size, but it's a structure. Uh, and my bed is a cube, it's a seven foot cube. Uh, but so I, there's, I, I like cubes and I like double cubes, but, but that's not really a formula. <laughs> One last question, please. Yeah. Anne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the best garden in the world and why? <laughs> And I will give you my answer. I think it's head cut because when you turn around the house, you see if you will stand under the cedar of Lebanon, which I think is the best tree in the world. And when you just lower the view, you will look through the heaven's gate. And when you will go all that, you will pass the red borders. Then we look to the left, and it's wonderful. And there's a tennis court. <laughs> I've been there what do you say many about times. That? Well. <laughs> Well, I suspect that the question was to <laughs> let us know what you thought of Hickok. Um, <laughs> Hickok's good. It's not the best garden in the world. Um, <laughs> it's a good garden. Clearly, there is no answer. 
I've visited thousands of gardens all over the world, and I'm often asked which is the best in the world. And I'm really, really pushed to pick my top ten. Really pushed. But the most romantic garden in the world is Nympha in Italy. The best formal, the most important formal garden in the world is Volo Vicon. Because La Notre, that was the garden that broke the mold and, and put it out. The, you know, in England, the, the most celebrated garden is undoubtedly Sissinghurst, not Hickert. But I do know which garden I like most in the world, without question, the garden with which I would swap all the other gardens in the world for, and that is my own. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer, uh, isn't it? Thank you very much, Montedon. Have you. a wonderful autumn in your own garden. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for you coming me. here. We're so thank happy you for that having you're here. Me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.